Our next topic is the future of the American Research University. And it's my distinct honor to introduce to you uh, our next speaker, Dr. Domenico Grasso, is, uh, who's the provost at the University of Delaware. Prior to his current position, he was vice president for research and dean of the graduate college at the University of Vermont. Prior to joining University of Vermont, Dr. Grasso was professor and head of the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Connecticut. Subsequently, he accepted the position of Rosemary Bradford Hewlett Professor and founding director of the Picker Engineering Program at the Smith College, the first engineering program at the Women's College in the United States. And most importantly, Dr. Grasso started his career right here at our very own esteemed Stevens Institute. So he's, uh, he's come back to this building after 20 years. And uh, there are very many familiar faces, uh, I, I assume, to Dr. Uh, Grasso. It's, it's interesting to see that interaction between Dr. Grasso and, and, and the old colleagues. Let's see, he uh, has been a visiting scholar at UC Berkeley, a NATO fellow, and an invited technical expert to the United Nations Industrial Development Organization in Vienna, Austria. As an environmental engineer and an advocate for the environment, Dr. Grasso has delivered a number of lectures across Taiwan as their national distinguished environmental lecturer. Dr. Grasso has authored a number of essays that have helped better define engineering for the 21st, 21st century. The most influential of these is holistic engineering. If you're interested, I have reference to the, uh, to the uh, essay. Dr. Grasso holds a Bachelor's of Science from Worcester Polytechnic Institute, a Master's degree from Purdue University, and a PhD from the University of Michigan. He is a registered professional engineer in the states of Connecticut and Texas, and a diplomat of the American Academy of Environmental Engineers. Please help me welcome Dr. Grasso as our next speaker. It's a, uh, a real pleasure to be back here after, it's more like 25 years, embarrassingly, uh, as opposed to 20 years, but I was just talking with some of my old colleagues here, and when I was here 25 years ago, it turned out that I was among the future leaders of this institution, and it was a, an interesting and very powerful cohort. I had Mike Bruno, who is now Dean of, uh, of the School of Engineering here, and Christos Crisolatis, who is now Vice Provost for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, and of course, George Corfiatis, who is now the Provost here. And at that time, we were all buddies, and we knew each other by our first names, and now they've risen to these very powerful positions at a very, very uh, prestigious and distinguished university. So I'm, I am delighted, not only delighted to be back here, but very proud to be back here where I actually had my start. And um, I just driving in, I, it brought back a lot of memories, not least of which was the traffic, which I, <laughs> is, I've tried to put in the back of my mind, but the views, Hoboken, everything here just brought back a lot of fond memories. We are clearly gathered here at one of the nation's elite research universities. If you look at the Carnegie classification, there are 1,833 universities that, uh, or institutions of higher education that are, are classified by Carnegie. Stevens is considered a research university with high activity, which places it in the top 11% of all the universities in the United States, which is very impressive among these 1,833. But unprecedented challenges confront our campuses. We face seismic shifts in public attitudes. We are challenged by new demographics and exploding technologies. We are beset by demands to act accountably towards students, parents, communities, taxpayers, 
and increasingly skeptical press questions our priorities, we must take charge of change. That was out of the Kellogg Commission report on the future state of land-grant universities, written in 1996, 18 years ago. It could have been written yesterday. It sounds like it was written yesterday. And nothing has really changed since that report came out. But we were admonished in that report to do something differently at our universities. More recently, uh, an NRC report, Research Universities in the Future of America, urged strengthening and expanding partnerships among universities, government, business, and philanthropy. America's research universities have emerged as a major national asset, per perhaps even its most potent one, the report said. This did not happen by accident. It began with the Morrill Land Grant Act of 1862 that established a partnership between federal government and the states in building universities that would address the challenges of creating a modern agricultural industrial economy for the 20, 20th century. Justin Morrill, who was the author of the Morrill Land Grant Act, was a senator from Vermont. So we had a great affection for land grant act in Vermont and its consequences. It was signed in 1862 in the darkest days of the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln took time out of trying to save the nation to sign an act that would have such profound consequences for our economy, for our civilization, and for our country. The act said that there was an endowment support, it was, in, it was created to endow, support, and maintain at least one college where the leading object would be, without excluding other scientific and classical studies, to teach such branches of learning as are related to agriculture, mechanic arts, in such a manner as the legislatures of the state may respectively prescribe in order to promote the liberal, and practical education of industrial classes in the several pursuits and professions of life. This is interesting because everybody thinks that the Land Grant, Grant Act was strictly a vocational act. It was not. It was intended to educate a, 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 uh, an electorate in, be, in the liberal arts as well as to prepare them for vocational activities. Its mission was to allow public access to higher education. Broader based education, including but, but not limited to the liberal education, provide education to impact the economic well-being, health, and welfare of the nation. Knowledge creation based on independent research, dissemination and application of information for public benefit. Those were the intents of this act. We are being called upon again as a nation to have our universities play a more major role in all of these same activities. 55% of top research universities are land-grant colleges. 60% of the top doctoral granting institutions are land-grant colleges. Land-grant colleges led a revolution in agricultural and food production quality and safety and educated millions of students. They've shaped public policy, created major economic returns to the nation, and exceeded expectations of investments multiple fold. But land-grant colleges are not alone in the impact on American history. Provost Jonathan Cole of Columbia recently wrote a book called The Great American University. And he also traces the private side of great American universities and their impact on the economy. The first American research university was Johns Hopkins, founded in 1876. German scholars fleeing Nazi Germany came to the U.S. in droves in the 30s and 40s to populate our laboratories. Federal policy of research funding led to tremendous growth after World War II, especially with the endless frontier of Van Veneer Bush. Now the U.S. has the world's greatest university system and 60% of all Nobel Prizes in the sciences since World War II have been awarded to Americans. The biggest threat isn't global competition. In fact, global competition would be more stimulating for us. Our biggest threat is internal. It's our perspective on what the research university should do. It's our involvement of government 
in the, in the, in the activities of research universities, and it's the, it's the goal of what the research university is all about. What has changed since the late 1800s, since Johns Hopkins was founded, since the Land Grant Act was signed? We've changed from an agrarian to a manufacturing to a knowledge-based society. In the 1800s, we were primarily an agricultural-based society. 80% or more of our labor force was in agriculture. In the mid-1900s, we were manufacturing-based society. The majority of our labor force was in manufacturing. Today, over 82% of our, our labor force in the United States is in services. Joe Helbley, Dean of Engineering at uh, Dartmouth and I, wrote a paper. We took college catalogs from the 1950s and looked at them, and we compared the engineering curricula of the 1950s to the engineering curricula of today. Guess what we found? It's the same. It's almost exactly the same, except now some schools require biology. But besides that, we teach engineering almost identically to the way we taught it in the mid-1900s. And yet, in the mid-1900s, we were preparing our engineers to go into a manufacturing-based society. Today, we're preparing them to go into a knowledge-based society, but the engineering education is essentially the same. What else has changed? Technology and computational power, global reach and competition, greater complexity of higher education, distance learning, a steep rise in cost of higher education, the headlong pursuit of university rankings, which is absolute nonsense. Merit versus need-based aid. Higher education increasingly is being perceived as a private benefit rather than a public good. University structures and systems undervalue or obstruct cross-disciplinary or multidisciplinary research that's essential to applied activities, applied research. US, the US share of science and engineering research articles is decreasing while China's is growing. And there has been a significant decline in public governmental support for higher education. In Delaware, we now have about $7,600 in 2010, which places a, per student, which places us in 41st in the United States, down 10.3% from 2001. In New Jersey, you're receiving about $13,000 13, per student, which places you at about 19th in the United States, down 13% from 2001. And the U.S. is down 6% to $12,000 since $12,000 on average per student uh, compared to 2001. What hasn't changed, those are things that have changed since the late 1800. What hasn't changed is how universities organize themselves. We are organized essentially the same way we were in, um, since about the Reformation since about 1520. We are organized as universities essentially the same way. Clark Kerr, the president of the University of California, actually published a paper on this. We, how we deliver education is essentially done the same way as we did in the 1800s. We are, we are not teaching differently today. We do have some flipped classrooms. It's interesting, if you, you're at a technical school and and the flipped classroom is, is taking hold at a lot of universities. But when I speak to the Dean of Arts and Sciences, he says to me, this flipped classroom stuff is nonsense. We've been doing it in the humanities for years. It's called read the book before you come to class. And it's the same thing that we're doing now in the sciences. The curriculum, as I've mentioned before, the curriculum has not changed significantly. And in some universities, the facilities haven't changed since the 1800s. <laughs> Stevens and UD both suffer as being great research universities without a medical school. Over the past 20 years, 
funding has shifted away from the physical sciences to the biological sciences. And if you look at the NIH budget, 30 billion, you look at the NSF budget, 7 billion, you can see that schools that have medical schools sig are significantly advantaged in the rankings and in their research productivity. If you, and I didn't do this for Stevens, and I apologize, but if you look at the University of Delaware, we do about $200 million worth of research a year, which places that at 111th. But if you compare, if you take the medical portion out of the schools that are in that ranking and then just compare us, we climb 40 spots to 71st. It's amazing how influential medical schools can be. But in addition to, to this, the single PI model, where you sit in your office or your laboratory and you write a proposal, is no longer viable. If you want to increase your research funding at a university, and Vice Provost for Research would be concerned about this, as I was, and you want to increase them by $50 million, let's say, and if you did it the way that we used to do it as a single PI, and you assume that you can write a grant and get $500,000 a year, and that your success rate is 10%, which is rather high these days, you would have to write 1,000 more proposals a year to do that. So we can't go down that path anymore. And this is why it is important for us to work in teams and to work uh, uh, on large center grants. We just submitted a proposal at the University of Delaware in the NNMI competition, the National Network uh, Manufacturing Institute competition, for $70 million, one proposal. The match that we had to go out and get companies to agree to was over $200 million. This is a different ball game than what we've been used to over the last several decades. The, f the future of research universities is changing dramatically. That same NRC grant that I mentioned earlier federal, said that federal funding for universities, uh, re university research has been unstable and in real terms declining at a time when other countries have increased funding for research and development, both in nominal terms and as a percentage of gross domestic product. Business and industry have largely dismantled large corporate research laboratories that drove American industrial leadership in the 20th century, such as Bell Labs, which I now understand is being turned into a shopping mall. But not, but not having, f but industry has not yet fully partnered with research universities to fill the gap. Research universities need to be responsive to stakeholders by improving management, productivity, cost efficiency, and both administration and academics. It's amazing how similar this report, which was just issued a year and a half ago, is to the Kellogg Commission report that was issued 18 years ago, calling for these same exact things, and yet nothing has changed since that report and this report. We need to strengthen the business role in research, partnerships, facilitating the transfer of knowledge, ideas, and technology to society, and accelerate time to innovation. The increase in university cost eff effectiveness and productivity is important to provide greater return on investment. And to secure the benefit of education for all Americans, including women and underrepresented minorities. This was a major finding of that report. Today, we still have about 18% of our undergraduate student body that are women. That is, again, unacceptable. It was 18% 10 years ago. It was 18% 20 years ago. But the thing that's changed, which makes this statistic even worse, is that 20 years ago, the percent of women at the universities was about 50 percent. Today it's 60 percent. So we have more women studying at universities, but we have fewer as a percent women studying engineering. This is unacceptable. Just earlier this week on Monday, President Harker, who is the president of the University of Delaware, along with the president from Caltech, Minnesota, Purdue, several other schools, published an article in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. And what they're calling for is for universities to take a different look at how they do personnel decisions around promotion and tenure. And that things like patents and licenses must count equivalent to articles. What's interesting about this is that as I was preparing for this talk, I noticed 
that Stevens specifically mentions patents and intellectual property as part of their tenure process. And they were actually called out in this article specifically. So you are ahead of where many universities need to go. I am so impressed with what I, when I was preparing for this, looked at on the website here and all the activities that you're involved in because you are doing the partnerships with industry, with government, with society that's so desperately needed and the leadership that's so desperately needed from uh, universities. And I, I'm just going to end very uh, uh, briefly here by just mentioning a strategic planning effort that we're undertaking at, um, at the University of Delaware because we're trying to restructure how we do our thinking as well. We're, we've had a strategic plan that President Harker uh, initiated when he came from Wharton a few years ago and it was called the Path to Prominence and we've executed that very well. We're going to pro propagate that forward now but we're going to restructure how we think about universities and university education. We're going to try to focus on three main topics. One, which everybody in this room probably hears about, is the grand challenges. What are the grand challenges that are facing society? And they're not limited to technology. And this is the whole point of all my work around holistic engineering. Technology will play a major role in the future of our, our, our planet and in future challenges, but technology is only part of it. Those solutions are going to be holistic. They're going to involve many other components. They're going to involve law, economics, policy. You can go down the list, psychology, behavioral sciences. So we have to have holistic solutions to the grand challenges. The second is the great debates. This is often left off as what we should be focusing on. There are great debates that are raging in our society. The great debates of our times have to have informed, educated individuals that have the critical thinking skills that can engage and help us define our future. We're facing many, many vexing problems that are going to have to involve engaged, thoughtful dialogue. And they could range from everything from when do human rights trump national sovereignty? Or as computational power increases, are we going to really discover that we do not have free will? And then the final uh, organizational principle that we're going to be focusing on is the great debates, the grand challenges. That's what we're engaged in today. The third is the big ideas. What hasn't anyone thought of yet? What are the problems that they haven't thought of? What are the opportunities that we haven't thought of? And the, this is where engineering really has an opportunity to shine, is to think totally out of the box, to think not about what the grand challenge is today. Sustainability, of course, we know sustainability is a grand challenge. Cybersecurity, clearly cybersecurity is a grand challenge. But what don't we know is right around the corner? And there are people who are thinking about those things, and we should really try to focus on making that a big part of the future of, of uh, universities. We must rethink everything as we go down this path. We must rethink how we structure ourselves as a university. We must rethink how we deliver our education, who with whom we partner, and how we are going to contain costs. In the last 25 years since I've been at Stevens, everything has changed. And I know everything will continue to change at a never increasing pace. We must be prepared to anticipate and to adapt. And I know and I am sure that Stevens will be, le will be leading the charge in this. Thank you. Um, so uh, we've all done a lot of thinking, uh, in particular over the last 10 years, about revamping, changing, modernizing the engineering curriculum. What role do accrediting, accrediting agencies like ABET, and by role I mean obviously negative and positive play or can play, should play in that, in that re-examination? Well, I think that uh, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, ABET has been, has been um, pointed to as both the proponent of change with ABET 2000 and then an inhibitor of change because they were not interpreting ABET 2000 the same way that others or uh, would have thought that the uh, the intent would have been. But I would argue uh, this, is that, um, and I know that many students go to college to uh, 
get a job, and oftentimes they need an ABET accredited degree to get a job. But I think that you can mount programs that are parallel to ABET accredited programs and not have them be ABET accredited. And, let, and they could be resource neutral because you could package courses, the same existing courses differently and allow students to take advantage of that. And many schools are doing this now. So when I was at Smith, we started with a Bachelor of Science degree that was ABET accredited, we got it accredited. But the next thing that we did, we started a Bachelor of Arts degree that is not accredited. Dartmouth has a Bachelor of Arts degree. Yale has one. Harvard has one. WPI now has one. The University of Vermont has one. These are degrees that are not ABET accredited. They teach students how to think like engineers, not necessarily that they can practice like engineers, but they can think like engineers, and they are exposed to broader curriculum. So they take the humanities, they take a lot of the courses that engineers would be otherwise locked out of. Then what they can do is in four years, they graduate. They can go to a master's degree program, nine months, which there are many of, and get a master's degree, an ABET accredited master's degree in engineering. So in four years and nine months, they have a broad undergraduate degree and a master's degree in engineering. The average time to graduate in engineering with a bachelor's degree in an ABET curriculum is 4.7 years. So you can package it this way. You could, have, you could even do it here. Say, you know, you're going to have an undergraduate degree. It's not accredited. But just stay for a little bit longer, which you may have had to stay anyway, and get a master's degree. You get the undergraduate degree that's, that's liberal and, and broad thinking with perhaps an opportunity to go overseas, because you can't do that in an ABEC curriculum, right? And then you get a master's degree. And you could do that. Stanford has a nine-month, MIT, Cornell, they all have nine-month master's degrees. Thank you very much. Maybe we can stand up here. Thank you a lot for your...